it is uh, a great honor to introduce Sarah Flanders. She has been and is a life long supporter of the Iranian Revolution. Sarah Farante is a coordinator International Action Center and a founder and the board of the National uh, United Anti-War Coalition and National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedom. She is a revolutionary. She is a revolutionary socialist and a leader and a journalist with work with the Workers World Party. She is co-author of 10 books on anti-imperialist topics. Sarah travels to Iran with uh, solidarity with Iran. She has organized anti-war delegation to Palestine, Iraq, and Syria, and helped mobilize numerous anti-war and anti-racist demonstrations. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I want to start by especially thanking uh, Kazem Azin for, and, and all the organizers of today's Iran Forum. Please join me in, in really, um, and, and I do hope that everyone here will read uh, the aims of the Iran Forum. This um, points of unity is very interesting because it, this is quite an accomplishment how uh, Iranian leftists evaluate Iran today. And in that sense, I, I really think that this is a historic event of Iranian leftists in the U.S. celebrating and analyzing the Iranian revolution. And as we hear clearly, there are two very different views. And then Kazem really gave a historic sweep and a Marxist view of both Iran and imperialism always seeking to grab hold of all the, the resources. This, the Iranian Revolution was an upheaval that dramatically and abruptly changed history. And I came to this forum today to learn, and I need to know a great deal more of the internal developments in Iran, and I think um, the, this presentation really helped to do that, the, all three. Uh, now, I have a pr perspective that I was asked to contribute to today's discussion, and this really is as an opponent of U.S. imperialism and its endless wars. And my perspective has always been to explain why U.S. imperialism is so hostile to the Iranian Revolution. So that's the angle at which I want to talk today. Whether the Republican or Democratic administration, there is no difference. They each are determined to use every possible tactic to overturn the Iranian Revolution. That's without a doubt, right? And the difference in U.S. relations with Iran during the decades of the Shah, the Pavlavi monarchy, and the 37 years since the Iranian Revolution, it's night and day. They were the closest friends with the Shah. That was their guardian uh, in the entire region. And they have been the fiercest opponents of the revolution, regardless of the different political groupings in office in Iran and regardless of the policies. And that is something to always keep in mind. Now, the Iranian revolution was one of those rare social explosions that breaks totally with the past. It was an uprising of the oppressed, of the masses in a surging movement that could not be stopped. And they, you remember the Savak coming out with machine guns. That, and, and the people's response was to come in the millions in burial shrouds. Wasn't that a response? It's never been seen what happened in the huge, it became unstoppable. U.S. imperialism supports and defends and reinforces the forces of reaction everywhere in the world. Global domination needs puppets and proxies and totally corrupt collaborators in every country, in every country. And the big hopes and expectations in Iran today and also the big apprehension is will putting an end to the sanctions 
and the changing economic patterns, what will that mean? And who's going to come out on top internally in Iran? That's, that's the question. One thing is clear, Iran's not going to be left alone, not for one minute to sort this out by themselves. And that's what we need to keep in mind from here. We have to take into account what are U.S. plans, because it won't be up to the Iranian people alone. It should be, but it won't be. Now, to put this in perspective, I want to raise the Haitian Revolution 225 years ago. You might say, why on earth? It was an earth-shaking event, an upheaval, a slave revolution where the slaves freed themselves. A fabulously wealthy colony based on slave labor and the export of sugar and coffee and cotton. And the Haitian Revolution faced a whole series of invasions, France, Britain, Spain, and the US. Impo absolutely incredible reparations were imposed on the Haitians for freeing, for liberating themselves. And Haiti suffered the longest sanctions in history, 60 years of US sanctions against Haiti. So every election in 200 years in Haitian history has had to deal with US intervention. It's not just intervention in Iran. There's been 200 years of assassination of leaders, kidnapping of leaders from Toussaint Louverture to the kidnapping of President Aristide. And it's also the use of UN agencies and military forces and non-governmental NGOs. I remember those famous NGOs, there's more of them in Haiti than any country. Now, Haiti's biggest problem, unlike the Cuban Revolution, was it came, which came 160 years later, was Haiti was isolated. But they were both small countries, not a military threat, but the threat of revolutionary ideas. That's what the threat to US imperialism is. The threat of revolutionary ideas and the oppressed taking history, taking their own destiny. That is really threatening. Now, so I, in raising the Iranian revolution, it's not surprising that US imperialism hates every accomplishment. They see every accomplishment in Iran as a dagger at themselves, at their plan for world domination. The ruling class may be smaller and smaller today in the world. They say 69 multi-billionaires own more than half the world. So it's a shrinking, but all the more powerful militarily. Less powerful economically, more willing and determined to use military force and absolute destruction. So nothing that Iran does will change this historic reality. And we should keep this in mind, whether moderate or so-called fanatical forces, left or right within Iran, if they seek the independence and sovereignty of Iran, they're the enemies of US imperialism. That's the way in which US imperialism sees it. Not the way we see it, but we have to keep in mind that is their calculation. The overturn in 1979 of the monarchy, it, it fundamentally decreased US influence in the entire region. And they have been trying to regain their footing ever since. The Iranian revolution broke decisively with US corporate domination, over the resources. It liberated Iran's oil and gas resources from the unequal contracts serving the giant multinational oil corporations, Exxon, Mobil, Shell. And it served as a revolutionary example. That's, that's its biggest, Iran's existence was a challenge. Now, Iran has a capitalist class that's anxious to increase their own profits and position. But the Iranian Revolution was forced to make a sharp break with imperialist domination, and it was the only way forward. There was a radical Muslim clerical leadership that had a strong anti-imperialist focus, and they have maintained that focus, this fundamental break for 37 years. And this does need to be recognized. I am so glad that the, the way in which Qasim raised this, because looking at it as leftists here, if we don't recognize the contribution to be able to hold back imperialism, what that means. 
developing an economy independent of Wall Street's theft and controlling their own resources, Iran transformed itself within three decades from an underdeveloped country with massive poverty into a modern state with a highly educated population. Isn't this true today? And while there are capitalist relations, there are clerical restrictions that prevails in Iran, that is true, the population was still able to win guaranteed comprehensive free medical care, free education, including university level, modern infrastructure, housing with full electrification. These aren't small things. Women's education improved from majority illiteracy to full literacy. 60% university students are women today in Iran. So these are huge accomplishments. But as we hear from the speakers, we know the class struggle continues in Iran. We want to keep in mind the class struggle on a global scale. Now, we're discussing elections in Iran. Will the US inter attempt to intervene in the elections in Iran? Of course. See, there's no country in the world today, no country, where US imperialism doesn't interfere in the elections. I mean, we could talk about Moldavia, or Ukraine, or Venezuela, or the Philippines. Any, any country, Haiti, absolutely. Yesterday, the US State Department, they, they warned Bolivia, don't you dare have a referendum on Evo Morales uh, running for president again. No, 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 he's had enough time. And they, they, it wasn't just a warning. They're doubling down their support for the ranchers and the mining corporations. That's, yes. that's who they want to win. U.S. corporate and CIA NGOs operate in every country. And their media station beams in, not only into Iran, into Venezuela, into Russia, into the Philippines. I could go on. We, we all know the power, and it's in every language, that message. That message that be with us, we're the force of modern progress. Be with imperialism, not us, the workers here who are losing more and more from all of this. Uh, William Bloom in, in Rogue State said that since uh, 1946, the US had, had attempted to overthrow 50 foreign governments, assassinate more than 50 foreign leaders, bombed people in 30 countries, U.S. bases are 20 times the total number of all other countries combined, their military bases. And th this is why this map is hanging up here. This is Iran surrounded by bases. You could also put up a map of Russia or China or any other country surrounded by U.S. bases and aircraft carriers. Um, it's to give not a moment's peace. By the way, tell me when my 20 minutes are up, just so I know. Uh, its tentacles are everywhere. They especially use youth movements. Youth, why? Youth are always interested in change and in a wider world, and they don't yet have political memory. So it's possible to ma masquerade as an exciting force for change, and it's a big challenge to every country that's attempting any form of independent development to constantly be on guard. Now, the Iranian Revolution was one of the most complex it was nationalist, it was religious, and it was anti-imperialist. And it was each of those things. And we don't want to speak against any of those things because they made a big contribution. U.S. think tanks worked overtime to shape a religious response that was thoroughly reactionary in the, modern, in the Muslim world to counter the influence of the Iranian Revolution. And so while they demonize Muslims in the US and in Europe, at the same time, through Saudi Arabia, they partnered with a totally reactionary and feudal monarchy and used a reactionary religious base within Islam in, in, in the funding and the creation of forces, whether it's Al Qaeda or da ISIS, Daesh, Whatever you want to call it, the purpose was the same, to have forces that were completely destabilizing the region and are in league with imperialism and are hostile not only to the Iranian revolution but to a secular state in Syria where the people own the oil wealth, 
or in Lebanon, or you could look anywhere in the region. This is the way in which the U.S. imperialists have attempted to use religion and to, to twist it and turn it at the same time it's being, Muslims are demonized right here in the U.S. So let's always keep that in mind. Um, now I want to say a word also on sanctions because the sanctions on Iran began long before Iran restarted the program for nuclear energy. Uh, nuclear energy began through the U.S. under the Shah and it cut with the Iranian Revolution and then began the sanctions. And it was only years later that Iran decided to restart the nuclear energy program. The sanctions on Iran are like the sanctions on Haiti 200 years ago. We, we should never forget that. And uh, like the blockade and the sanctions on Cuba or Zimbabwe or Libya or Syria or Sudan and against the Soviet Union too. The purpose of the sanctions is always to frustrate and block the development of the productive forces in ways that, that if the productive forces grow, it improves the life of the general population. The imperialists don't want that. They seek to destabilize and to distort economic development in order to keep it chained to the global market, chained to Wall Street. And it, it, it really forces the, the masses of people to always be thinking that the shortages, you know, this actually helps fuel an opposition. And it dislocates the economy. So it helps the efforts of regime change. Now, the struggle to get the sanctions lifted also leads to every country being forced to make concessions. And it also creates pressures among the diverse groups in a governing coalition of every country. And it's meant to do that too. It's meant to increase the pressures within a country. How do they get out from underneath the sanctions? Now, the nuclear five plus one deal on ending the sanctions, I just want to repeat again, sanctions are like, uh, you know, nuclear armed pirates, you know, uh, the sanctions on, on Iran, you know, they began 1980, but then they were followed by UN security sanctions, which was US pressure in 2006, 2008, 2011, and then European sanctions 2010, 2012, each one of them more and more and more intense. And finally, US sanctions legislation that demanded every country in the world participate in a blockade of Iran or face severe U.S. penalties and be cut off from the vast network of U.S. banking and loans and credits. Russia and China have been consistently for ending the sanctions because they face sanctions and encirclement themselves. The Western imperialist powers, Germany, France, Britain, the European Union, they were willing to participate if U.S. schemes could be accomplished and if the sanctions would achieve the goal of regime change. They were in it if they thought it would work. But they had little d interest in doing was, what was not favorable to their own capitalist interests, and the sanctions didn't work. So that became the pressure to end the sanctions. There were divisions among the European imperialists, and there was added pressure, and it made it impossible for the U.S. to just walk away from the negotiations, which they had do, done for years and years. So this agreement to end the sanctions was a huge achievement for Iran. Whenever an oppressed country besieged by imperialism is able to gain a treaty, even for the indigenous people here, able to gain a treaty, even a temporary agreement to forestall outright war, while maintaining their sovereignty, it should be acknowledged as a victory over U.S. intransigent. But it's not the end of the struggle, not at all. And it responded, followed just uh, two weeks after with the U.S. saying there's going to be new sanctions. Anyone, business people who travel to Iran then can't travel to the U.S. You know, they, okay, they've ended the, the what were called the nuclear sanctions, here's a new round. And it was a way of showing complete hostility and that the pressure will continue. 
Now, I want to say something on the on the green revolution in, in Iran, and this is controversial. I, but see, U.S. imperialism is always looking for weak spots. Iran has every right to hold elections and have different contending views. The problem was from here, U.S. imperialism intervened directly in the green movement in Iran. And that is different. It does not mean that the green movement was an imperialist movement. It was not. But it means that imperialism will use every possible crack and difference to try to drive a wedge. The U.S. imperialists, they don't want normal relations with any political current in Iran, whether moderate, quote, fanatic, militant, determined, or willing to make many concessions. That's, that's not true anywhere in the world. They want to destroy it, totally. And so keeping that in mind, it's only possible to resist this imperialist influence when there's unity, if the isolation can be broken. Now, now take in Vietnam a few decades ago. There it was socialist solidarity. Now socialism has suffered some enormous setbacks. And today it is a whole number of targeted countries who understand that it's in their basic national self-interest to support each other. And that's the basis for Iran, Russia, and China, for a whole number of different countries, Syria, Hezbollah, in Lebanon, to be aiding each other and also being a dividing line against total U.S. conquest. The Syrian war, the war in Syria, it's not about Bashar al-Assad. It's really an imperialist demand for the total surrender in Syria, regime change. The government must resign, must collapse, and there'll be no peace until there's total surrender. That, that's a demand. It's made by the State Department all the time. Can't be a peace agreement unless the government collapses in total. But it's much more than about Syria. It's really also a proxy war against Iran and against Russia. I mean, let's be honest. Every yes. tactic they're using in Syria, the, the next day, where is it going to open up? It's a war to decide domination and control of a whole region. And Saudi Arabia and the Gulf monarchies and Turkey and, of course, Israel, they all consider Iran a rival for influence in the region. Now, I want to skip some of this. Um, let me just take a minute here because I think I'm going to run out of time. Um, U.S. policy, though, has been a massive and horrific failure. Their policy on Syria, that Assad must go, there was enormous, I mean, the uh, Syrian army refused to collapse. The collaborators refused to step forward in more than a handful. And that is quite an accomplishment. And then not only that, but Iran and Hezbollah and Lebanon and then Russia stepped in with military assistance. And that's important. So also the U.S. failed in the conquest of Iraq. The forces were literally were driven out. That's right. And that's why the support for Daesh or ISIS today. They want to make the Iraqis and the Syrians pay a terrible price and divide the country. The only yeah. solution is to divide Shia and Sunni yes. and Arab and Kurd, Christian and Muslim. I, I mean, how many ways can you divide the country? That's what they want to do. They say, oh, this is the only solution for Iraq. There's no end in sight to the war in Afghanistan. And that keeps that huge U.S. military presence right on Iran's border. And it's meant to do that also. Yesterday, they bombed Libya again, yesterday. And this is a country that they've already brought to total ruin, complete ruin, the, the most modern, advanced, richest country of Africa that through its loans and aid was giving so much aid and was, was was on the doorstep of setting up an African currency. You could see why the French and the U.S. would hate that. 
what they did to Libya was to totally, totally destroy the infrastructure and every accomplishment. Now all these wars come home here. The U.S. today has an actually sinking life expectancy. In more than half the counties in the U.S., life expectancy for women is going down. The highest rate of infant mortality in the developed and industrialized world is today in the U.S. So every one of the figures on health care, on life expectancy, on women's mortality and childbirth are the worst in the U.S. of any developed country. And this is a cost of endless wars. It's enormously profitable for the U.S. corporations. And it's so true, right, racism in the U.S means that it's even worse in terms of black and Latino. Today, black men in the U.S. have a lower life expectancy than men in Bangladesh. We should look at and know some of these figures of what austerity and poison water in Flint means. It's a direct outcome of U.S. wars. Now, U.S. hostility will be a calculation of every group within Iran. It's a big issue in every election. And there, by the way, there still are important factions in the U.S. who are determined to push for war with Iran. That's not off the agenda. Oh, okay, good. I'm just at the end. Uh, so that's something we have to keep in mind, too, that real out, out not war with Iran is not off the agenda. There are powerful forces pushing very much for it. Now, and also there's a very, very dangerous situation right now, of course, with Syria, where we don't know if, if Turkey, Saudi Arabia, if, if troops really, there's real confrontation with Russia. I, there's no time to go into that, but I think everybody here, sitting here, knows this, that you have to look at the whole region and what it means when the wars come home and the wars lay havoc in entire countries. Now, what does here in the Imperialist Center defending Iran mean? It doesn't mean agreement with everything that Iran does. As we hear, they're very different political currents. But in the center of imperialism, it does mean to demand at every step, U.S. hands off Iran. That's, that's important. It means defending the gains of Iran. The, the struggle in Iran today has shifted from a political and a military struggle to an economic struggle. And it means that the race is on for economic penetration. And there are a lot of corporations that are just rushing to Tehran. Can they sign the contracts? As they are with Cuba, too. And how can they use it to penetrate? So we need a strong, conscious movement here in the center of imperialism that defends Iran's sovereignty, defends its economic development in the face of endless threats and provocations. The challenge is for Iran to keep their economy independent of imperialist domination and yet continually developing and modernizing. And in order to do that, we have to join hands to say, hands off Iran. Thank you. Thank you.